Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I know that there are people still joining, so I'm going to give it just a few more minutes before we get started. But thank you for taking part of your evening to be with us this evening for this really important discussion. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes. While we're waiting for everyone to join, I'll just make a note that, that you can turn on the closed captioning, the CC icon at the bottom of your screen. I also want to let you know that we have turned off disabled the chat function. However, we do have Q&A open. So as we're going through our discussion this evening, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A dropdown box. I'll give it just one more minute and then we'll get started. All right, let's get started. I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Again, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Let me introduce myself first. I'm Pam Wilson, and I am the president of the League of Women Voters of Ohio Board of Directors. I'm also a proud member of the Licking County Local League. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to join us for this important and very relevant topic. It's the state and the future of public education. Public education in the United States has a very deep history. The first public school was opened in the American colonies in 1635. It was the Boston Latin School, and that school remains open today. The first public schools generally were limited access primarily to white males um, and were not always free. But over time, public schools have become more accessible and more inclusive. They have been seen until very recently as a public good. The League of Women Voters has long valued and supported a strong public education system. The US statement on the role of the federal government in education reads, the League of Women Voters believes that the federal government shares with other levels of government, the responsibility to provide an equitable quality public education for all children from pre-K through grade 12. A quality public education is essential for a strong, viable, and sustainable democratic society, and it is a civil right. LWV Ohio also believes that public education is an essential foundation for a strong democracy. Our policy position states, public education is an LWVO priority. The public system serves as a civil, as a civic purpose rather than as an individual right. It is essential to our democracy. And we have put action behind those words. Beginning in the 90s, legislators began to put forward policies just diminishing our public education system. LWV Ohio embarked on research, analysis, and then adopted and modified our positions in order to reinforce our support for public schools. Becoming a more forceful advocate and often joining lawsuits to challenge the erosion of our public school systems. The challenges to both public education and democracy occur on multiple fronts. These involve funding, equity, and curriculum. And we see this happening daily in our state and local school board battles. The wolf is at the door. So let's begin this critical discussion, but let me introduce our guest speaker, Jack Schneider is the author of several books, including the book that is the basis for tonight's discussion, The Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door, The Dismantling of Public Education and the Future of School. He is also a recipient of the Dwight W. Allen Distinguished Professor Award. He's executive director of the Beyond Test Scores Project, director at the Center of Public uh, Educational Policy, co-editor of the History of Education Quarterly, and co-host of the podcast, Have You Heard? Welcome, Jack. I'm glad you found time to, to be with us this evening. Thank you so much for having me. And I'd like to introduce our moderator this evening, Dr. Sarah Stritzklein. 
a professor of education and an affiliate professor of philosophy at the University of Cincinnati. Sarah is also president of the John Dewey Society and co-editor of the journal, Democracy and Education. She's co-director at the Center for Hope and Justice Education, and she is a recipient of the U University of New Hampshire Outstanding Professor Award and the University of Cincinnati Distinguished Teaching and Golden Apple Awards. She is also the author of American Public Education and the Responsibility of Its Citizens, Supporting Democracy in an Age of Accountability, and also Learning How to Hope, Reviving Democracies Through Schools and Civic Society. We are so honored to have two such distinguished scholars help us understand the challenges for our public schools and what we can do to help them. Thank you both for being here. Sarah, I'll turn this over to you. Thanks, Pam, and so happy to be here tonight uh, with my, my friend Jack Schneider and to introduce him to many of my friends here in Ohio and through the league. Um, Pam did a great job, I think, of, of setting the scene about how important public education is uh, to the league. Uh, and of course, you know, with the League, Jack, we do a lot to encourage civic participation, to get voters out there, but we don't just want to get voters to the polls. We want to make sure our voters are well informed about big, important public matters like education. Um, so we're hoping tonight that you can help us get a better understanding of what's at stake for democracy when it comes to some of the recent shifts that we've seen in educational policy, um, particularly those that might be moving us away from public education and toward more privatized alternatives. So I'm going to jump in with some questions. Um, I know you're a historian of, of education, Jack, so I think we start with a little bit of history lesson tonight. Um, I would love if you could help us get an understanding of the role that public education has, has played in our country in its past, help us understand kind of what the key features, what distinguishes a public education, and I think that'll get get us to a point where maybe we understand why uh, public education has been so important in American history. Thanks, Sarah. And it's so nice to be with you here tonight. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with Sarah's work, she is one of the smartest thinkers in education research. So you should go out and, or don't go out, just stay home and Google her and read everything of hers that you can find online. Um, so uh, great question. And, and I think that it's so important because we don't tend to think of public education as having identifying features. We tend to simply think of it as being there. Um, if it has an identifying feature, for most people, I would imagine that it is its cost-free nature, right? I think a lot of people imagine that public schools are private schools that you go to for free. And I think that gets a lot wrong about public education and precisely for the reason that you alluded to in the second part of the question, because I think because of some of the core characteristics of public schools, they actually end up doing a lot more for our democracy than a privatized alternative. So what are some of those core features? Well, one is that they are taxpayer supported. That does mean that they do not charge tuition, but what it also means is that we all have a stake in the public schools, right? By virtue of the nature of how we fund them, we all are signaling that public education returns value to each of us, right? It isn't simply that we've all decided to chip in for, you know, the 50 million American kids who can't afford private school. That isn't how it works, right? We have decided collectively over time that this is something that makes our local, state, and national communities stronger. So, the first thing I would start with is taxpayer support. The second thing that I would start to is very related and that's democratic control, right? One of the things that we usually get in return for uh, spending our tax dollars on something is some control over um, the institution itself. And so we have democratic control at the local level via our school boards. Now we could have a whole separate conversation. And I know, Sarah, that you are well qualified for that conversation about the effectiveness um, or lack thereof of school boards. But there's a lot to suggest that the democratic control of local public schools via local school boards has, despite its warts, has given us more in terms of a benefit to our democracy and a benefit to our education system than it has cost us in terms of inefficiencies. 
Um, the, the third piece that I would talk about here is that our schools are open enrollment, um, that students don't get turned away. And one of the things that we may get into later is that advocates of a privatized system in which individuals are consumers in a free market and they are aided in entering that market by vouchers, right? Because not everybody would be able to operate in a free market using their own dollars. Um, this is something that is popular right now in most states with red legislatures. We have seen voucher bills introduced. And one of the things that voucher advocates will say is that this is going to give families more options. And I think it's important to talk about the alternative to options, which is rights. And there are lots of students who are presently enrolled in the public education system for whom there would be no options or might be no options, but for whom in a public education system that operates on an open enrollment basis, um, we, you know, with some limits there, right? We could talk about how open enrollment it is that you have to live within district boundaries. Um, but, you know, I'm thinking specifically of students with disabilities, right? Who for most of American history actually were denied access to education, but who now has have very firmly enshrined rights and cannot be turned away and cannot be denied um, the least restrictive equal education available to them. Um, I'm thinking of students of color who historically were denied access to the schools who have very firmly enshrined rights. I'm thinking of students who right now we see being turned away from religious schools, right? Students who identify as LGBTQ+, um, who again have rights in the public schools. And I think that that's another key distinguishing feature. Um, I'll just give you two more. One would be the, the egalitarian basis upon which we operate our schools now, the degree to which it's realized um, has always been imperfect. But I think there's lots of evidence to suggest that the fact that we have this kind of egalitarian principle, right, that it, it should more or less, public education should more or less be provided on an equal basis to all young people, at least within various borders, whether they be local, state, um, national, that that principle has actually forced us to live out our ideals in an ever more um, real way via our laws, our policies, and our actions. And then finally, the one that may not be obvious to folks who you know were already cued into taxpayer support, democratic control, open enrollment, egalitarianism, would be the, the multi-purpose nature of our schools. Um, and that's been with us from the beginning, that our schools have never solely been about preparing students for vocations, preparing students for the job market, nor have they only been about preparing students for the rigors of citizenship. They've always been about those things and many other things as well, preparing students for their lives, preparing students to lead fulfilling personal lives, preparing students to live in, you know, a, a diverse, polyglot, multiracial, multi-ethnic, you know, multi-religious republic. And, and I think that that's an important feature there that is connected to those other things, right? To That is one of the reasons we support schools with our tax dollars. It is one of the reasons why we want democratic control to ensure that as the political winds shift, we don't lose the things that we, the people historically have wanted our schools to do, which are many. Mm -hmm. Well, I like too that you're giving us kind of a bigger picture of what those schools do, and perhaps not just for the kids too, but also for those communities, right? There's spaces where the community gathers and meets. Um, I happened to visit my father last weekend, and he commented he'd just been to the local high school for the uh, Future Farmers of America. They had a tractor show. My, my dad's a farmer, and so he was really excited to go gather with the other farmers to see the tractors and learn about yeah. what the FFA students were doing. And that's an important role to serve beyond just the immediate education of children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Jack, as you were going through all of that, you know, I'm thinking like there's so much to celebrate here about public education, but you also warn it in your in your book um, that public education is an easy target. And I'm trying to kind of figure out why is that? You know, what sorts of critiques are coming up about public education that have been used to discredit it or kind of work against it? 
Yeah, yeah. A, a, another really good question. And I think in the same vein as that first question, because it is forcing us to try to see the water in which we swim, um, to try to name some of the things that we take for granted and that in naming might become more salient for us in our day-to-day -day lives. And so I think you know that would be the first part of my answer, which would be that schools are an easy target because they are so easy to take for granted, right? If, if all of us during our lifetimes had had to fight for the creation of a public education system that was taxpayer supported, democratically controlled, open enrollment, et cetera, et cetera, right? Had we had to fight for that, I think it would be much more difficult to take for granted the existence of the 98,000 public schools that we have across 13,000 school districts. Right? It, it's incredible, right? Today, imagine if you brought forward, let's say in Ohio, a bill that would create, let's imagine libraries, public libraries don't exist. You were going to create libraries in Ohio for the first time. I, I think there is no chance that it would pass through the legislature, right? And end up with the governor signing it at the end and everybody agreeing this was a good, I think that people would tear each other apart with you know, half of Ohioans saying, you know, what do we need free books for? Um, and and I think that that's where we are right now in the United States and, and we will move past this. But I think that as a background for understanding how it is that we spend the better part of a trillion dollars to educate 50 million kids for 180 days a year, again, across 98,000 schools in which there are trained and licensed educators, right? Professionals who in the vast majority of cases know what they're doing, right? And in the vast majority of cases, kids come home and say they've learned something, that they were safe, that mostly they got treated with dignity and respect. Like, you know, this is an accomplishment, but it's always been there for us. And, and unlike so many institutions, we have all spent tremendous time in the public schools, right? Imagine if we had all spent 13 years, 180 days a year in the post office, we would know every way in which the post office falls short. And I say this as somebody who complains when the mail doesn't come, right? <laughs> Like, what is going on right now? Why is there no mail today? It cl clearly couldn't be that we didn't get any letters. Something is is amiss. Um, so th that that's a part of the story here. Um, a part of the story is that schools are everywhere. And the fact that there are so many of them just leads to the opportunity for storytelling. Storytelling that is usually grounded in truth, right? But if you say, there is something bad happening today in one of 98,000 schools in America, and we're talking about a vanishingly small percentage of schools. That's another way of saying it is that in 99.99% of the schools, everything went well, everything went to plan today. But you can always find a case that you can then turn into a national story. And one of the reasons you can turn it into a national story is that while schools are local in their nature, they are national in their character. So the curricular standards in Ohio may be different from the curricular standards where my daughter's in school here in Massachusetts, but by and large, the things that she's learning in class are not so different from the things that eighth graders in Ohio are learning. The school more or less looks the same, I would imagine. The cafeteria more or less operates the same Probably way. smells the same too. I, I would imagine, as does the, the gym, right? <laughs> um, and And so what that means is that a, a story that is used, well, you know, we could talk about the media separately, but, I, you know, used for political purposes to try to frame public education as, let's say, failing, right? That that story will resonate with people across the United States, even if it only represents one tiny fraction of what's happening that day in America. Um, you know, combine that with the fact that the operation of public schools is transparent by nature. So we have all heard, I'm sure, scandals coming out of both public and private schools. But I can tell you that 
you hear of a much larger percentage of the ones coming out of public schools because of things like, you know, laws that require people to report particular kinds of incidents and open records laws. And, and these are the kinds of things that we absolutely want in place. We want that transparency in place. But that certainly does facilitate the kind of storytelling about schools that takes place. Um, I, I give you two more reasons. Uh, one is we care tremendously about our schools. I gave you the example of the post office earlier. You know, I do. I like when the mail comes. I particularly like when the teeny tiny royalty checks come. You know, it's like, oh, look, I'm, I made an, an extra two dollars from sales of my first book. Um, but at the end of the day, I don't actually care that much if I don't get mail for a few days. And I do know for a fact that my post, he admitted it and that's okay. It's okay. He's overburdened. And so he stashes mail uh, and won't hit every house every single day. But that's the sort of thing, the equivalent of that, we would find completely unacceptable in our schools because we're dealing with children who are ours or who are our somebodies and who we care about, who again have rights in those schools. And so the fact that we care so much about public education means that we are always attending to every way in which it is falling short. And I think that's a good thing, right? Because it forces us to always be thinking about how to improve and do right by young people as well as by each other, since we all have a stake in public education. But when you combine that with the fact that we take them for granted and so rarely celebrate their strengths, I think it leads to a particular kind of environment where we tend not to recognize that the good outweighs the bad in the vast majority of cases on the vast majority of days. And I'll just conclude this response by saying that there has been a critique that has emerged that is politically convenient. Um, and, and I say this knowing that I am uh, you know, being watched for the degree to which I am being nonpartisan as instructed, um, that it's politically convenient to tell a story about failing schools. And both major parties have taken advantage of this storyline over the past 40 years. Most people root it in 1983 with the publication of the A Nation at Risk report, which was kind of a surprise sensation. And the Reagan administration decided that maybe it would begin to do some work in public education, despite the fact that originally Reagan's only interest in education was he wanted to float a small voucher bill um, at the federal level. Uh, William Bennett was gonna help him do it as secretary of education. And actually civic groups like the League of Women Voters were very active in pushing back against that. And Reagan decided maybe he didn't wanna have anything to do with, um, with public education, but, but a nation at risk gave the Reagan administration a, a chance to talk about what it would do to fix America's quote unquote broken schools. George H.W. Bush picked up on this. He was the first to say he wanted to be the education president. Yeah. Bill Clinton, when he defeated George H.W. Bush, picked up again and carried forward some of George H.W. Bush's failed legislation. Um, so we're talking about Goals 2000 and America 2000, which eventually morphed into No Child Left Behind, George W. Bush's signature education legislation, which Barack Obama oversaw the reauthorization of in the form of the Every Student Succeeds Act. And so this has been a bipartisan endeavor, and it's been quite successful in terms of being able to uh, tell stories about the failings of our schools and to position um, leaders, whether it be at the national level or you, we've seen lots of governors do this, as well as in cities, people talking about being the education mayor. Um, so in city, yeah. I, I live in the Boston area, so we certainly saw that for 20 years in Boston. Um, it's easy to then use the schools as a way of positioning a, a political candidate as a potential savior to the woes that are documented in our you know, transparent system where there's always something going wrong someplace and where we so rarely are celebrating the ordinary victories that happen every single day when kids show up, they learn something, they come home safe. You know, Jack, I shouldn't be surprised. And here you go as a historian, right? You're kind of setting this, the big picture for us. I think it's helpful for us to remember about how those narratives of public school failure have um, come across parties, come across years and kind of developed together over time. 
but it does feel like something is escalating or changing recently. And I want to kind of push you into like telling us more about what sorts of values are underlying some of the kinds of policies we're seeing right now that are some of the more direct attacks on public education than perhaps we saw in some of the earlier examples you were just noting. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we have seen over the past, I would say, seven years, a transformation in the attacks on public education, which have shifted from um, politically expedient attacks on the schools that are then used as a rationale for reform, a shift from that to attacks on the schools that are used as a rationale for a total transformation. Right. Uh, and right. and th this, this didn't come out of nowhere, right? So some people saw Betsy DeVos as being the architect of this shift because we really began to see the, the rhetoric, at least at the national level, change when DeVos came in as Secretary of Education, right? So previously, it almost didn't matter who, uh, which, which, which administration, Republican or Democrat, had appointed the Secretary of Education, the kind of rhetoric was largely the same, right? Margaret Spellings, for instance, George mm -hmm. W. Bush's um, uh, first Secretary of Education, uh, sounded much the same as Arne Duncan, who was Barack Obama's Secretary of Education for most of his time in office. Um, DeVos sounded very different, right? DeVos was decidedly disinterested in public schools, she visited a lot of private schools. She talked a lot about um, how systems, and by that she meant the nature and form of public education as it presently exists, fail students and that students should not be subjected to systems, that that was a form of adult interests and that what we ought to do, and her favorite metaphor was, put money in each child's backpack right. and let that child take that backpack where they wanted to go. This, this was not a new storyline, though, and this was not Betsy DeVos's storyline, though she has been a major figure in the evolution of this thinking. It really dates back to the 1960s and 70s, and we can date it back to the thinking of Milton Friedman, the free market economist. We can date it back to some of the things that Barry Goldwater said in his failed run for the presidency. We can date it back to some of the favored policies of largely right-wing donors. And the, the core ethos there was that public education borders on socialism that uh, it's massively expensive, that it is run uh, as a government bureaucracy, right? You, you can see how some for some people, the idea of dismantling public education just makes plain sense. Mm -hmm. It should be run through the free market rather than via democratic politics, which critics will say is you know, subject to inefficiency and capture. Um, it should not be a unionized sector. Uh, so much of the antipathy towards public education comes from the fact that public education is, is the most unionized sector of the American economy in as much as we would say that education is a part of the economy, because it is. It employs over 3 million teachers every year. Um, and, you know, I, I alluded to, you know, public education smacking of socialism, but it, of course, advances collective interests rather than the interests of individuals who might choose for themselves something quite different than what we collectively choose via our democratically controlled public education system. Now, I'll lay my cards on the table. I happen to like the fact that public education is something that we do collectively and that we decide on together. And I think that that's actually, if you believe in democracy, that's actually a kind of definition of democracy. And it's a, a prerequisite, I think, given the fact that we have so few places in our society to practice the skills of reasoning together through different kinds of problems and coming up with solutions that may not satisfy us all, but may satisfy us um, and, and may at least not anger the vast majority of us. Um, but to, to wind all of this back to your question, this push to unmake public schools was wildly unpopular. 
Nobody in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, or 90s wanted anything to do with it, yet it didn't go away because it remained a kind of policy dream among those who would end up starting, running, or working in groups like the Heritage Foundation, um, the American Enterprise Institute, the Cato Foundation, um, or is it Cato Institute? I think Cato is an institute. Um, Hoover over at Stanford, at the state level, uh, groups like uh, the Mackinac Center in Michigan, uh, here in, in Massachusetts. Uh, we've got the Pioneer Institute, the Goldwater Institute in Arizona. There are various Freedom Foundations uh, at the state level. I think Ohio has one. And so a, a policy apparatus was built to try to continue to move forward in some small or large way, this vision of privatizing education, and to keep these ideas alive, if only in particular quarters. Mm -hmm. And what really changed, I would argue, would be first, the, the pandemic created an opportunity for people to say that the education system had really failed. It was, it was um, you know, a kind of disaster moment that could be leveraged. Um, and people talked quite openly about it at the time. Yeah. And there's a, a large historical literature on the use of disasters for the purpose of driving through large scale transformation efforts that already had been mapped out. Um, so a kind of, you know, a crisis opportunism there was a part of it. Another part of it was um, the fact that Betsy DeVos was, is a true believer in this, and she did have the bully pulpit, and there was the opportunity to try to use her uh, stature there as a way of, you know, not whipping votes literally, but metaphorically, right, bringing together a kind of movement. I think also the fact that the, the elevation of the, the notion of education as a private good has happened over the course of more than a century, but it is almost reached its apotheosis, where I think for many of us, we think first of education, not as something that we do for ourselves collectively, not as something that returns value to all of us, to our communities, to our economy, certainly, but to, you know, the, the form and fabric of our society. I think for many of us, the first thought is education is something that you get for yourself to get ahead. And it's both, right? It's a private good as well as a public good. Yeah. And, and when you think about education as a private good, as a commodity to consume, as a credential to acquire, as something that will allow you to be socially mobile rather than as something that will strengthen democratic equality, I think that is much more conducive to a message about quote unquote education freedom and the idea that you will be freed from the quote unquote system via quote unquote money in a backpack to then exercise whatever your choice is. Um, and then the final factor would just be the intense polarization that we've seen in this country over the past decade. Um, and, and people essentially throwing up their hands in many cases and saying, I give up, right? I, I wanna walk away. I wanna go do my own thing with my own people. Mm -hmm. And I would say it's precisely because of that, that we need to redouble our efforts to protect and preserve public education because once we walk away, right, there are very few venues for us to come back together again. Um, yeah. There are very few systems and structures that we have in this society that force us to come together across difference to try to work through and make decisions with the best interests of the whole in mind. So Jack, I want to kind of bring it down a little bit. So you just told us a lot about like big institutes, powerful people like Betsy DeVos, big people in policy, you know, who are kind of using this narrative and these moments of, of crisis to kind of push through some of these changing policies. I want to bring it down to the individual voter. Um, and, you know, the, the parent uh, who maybe has a child in the school or the neighbor who, you know, may not have a child or their child has grown, but they still, you know, have some connection to the school and care about what's going on there. And, and I wonder, you know, there, there's some folks who are are quite moved by the, the move toward privatization. It's appealing to them. They see some rewards and benefits there. Maybe you could articulate some of those. But also, on the other hand, we've also seen pushback against that kind of privatization effort. Um, 
most notably, um, not here in Ohio, but recently in Texas, we saw a lot of rural voters pushing back against uh, a move toward vouchers there. We, we see some of that within our rural communities in Ohio. And it's kind of, if you could kind of lay the land for us in terms of the individual voter and who's supporting, who's pushing back on those kinds of yeah. initiatives. Yep, yep. Yeah, you know, I think the first folks I would start with in terms of those who have been open to privatization would be low income families and families of color who felt, and rightly so, um, marginalized and disenfranchised and dispossessed for much of their experience in public education. So the first voucher program was in Milwaukee. Um, and there were many Black civil rights activists in Milwaukee who were strong advocates of this voucher program. Now, it was politically expedient for the conservatives who worked to push this through because uh, they framed it not as a universal voucher, but as something that would only be open to people who met particular income requirements. And could, it could therefore be framed as a kind of social justice effort from the right. Um, but, you know, it was a way station for them, which is, I think, important to recall, right? It, it was a, a step on the way towards universal privatization. We have almost always seen that anytime there's been a voucher program, it has started with um, an income qualification first or some form of qualification that limits the size of the program. But nevertheless, it's important to recognize that the members of the African-American community there who were in favor of this were, were not pawns. They were not duped, right? For them, it was about trying to gain some measure of community control when the democratic control that was due to them as members of a democratic society was denied. Yeah. And so I think that that's important to remember is that some of this pushback is because of our failings as a society in terms of fulfilling our obligations in you know, the things we say a public education system is and does. There are also folks who have never been interested in being a part of the public education system, either because they hold particular political values or religious values, or they hold some other set of values that makes the idea of sending their children to school for 180 days a year and receiving instruction that is secular or at least, you know, ostensibly secular um, and that exposes them to particular kinds of curricula, knowledge, learnings, students, um, that, that that is not something that they want to subject their children to. And they have always had the constitutional right to withhold their children from the public schools as long as they educate them somehow. Um, so we've got over a century of Supreme Court jurisprudence that says essentially, you know, parents do have rights. And uh, as long as the rights of the child are not being violated, and as long as the rights of other members of the democratic society in terms of Oh, I think we may have lost Jack. Jack, if you hear us, you're frozen. I'll give Jack a second to see if he can recover. And while he is, I'll remind folks who are listening at home, if you have questions you would like to pose to Jack, feel free to drop those into the Q&A. And as we get Jack back on, I'll try to sort through those. Um, looks like he's trying to get back in right now. There he is. Welcome boy, back, Jack. I, I was really on a roll there. And then I realized that you hadn't moved. I thought, boy, Sarah's really not picking up what I'm putting down here. Maybe I should. And then and then everything went black. OK, well, we're back. Uh, I'll I'll sort of wrap that part up and say that, you know, there, there are folks who have good reason. And when I say good reason, I don't mean I agree with them, but they have well articulated reasons uh, for why they support vouchers or some other form of privatization. Um, and 
we agree to disagree uh, there. There are also, however, um, I think a lot of Americans who simply don't understand yet, I have a lot of faith in Americans that they will understand it eventually, but who don't yet understand what the full implications of um, vouchers or other forms of privatization will be for them, their communities, and for all of us collectively. And so to the second part of your question about communities that have pushed back and particularly rural communities, and I think this was has been a surprise to some, including to some in the Republican Party, um, who have assumed that the rural base uh, would go along with this, what is now a, a sort of tenet um, of the Republican Party platform. Um, and there's been a lot of pushback uh, from rural Republicans, not just in places like Texas, but also places like Idaho, um, uh, New Hampshire, right? Some states with um, very sparse populations for whom the local public schools are actually a pillar of the community yeah. um, and who actually have a lot to teach the rest of us in terms of using public schools as public spaces, as seedbeds of democratic life, as ways of coming together across social and economic difference. And in many of these rural communities, it just also so happens that the public school is often the largest employer. In many of these rural communities, it also happens to be the case that whatever the quote unquote options are, that students and their families will have when their local public school gets closed down are likely to be online because there isn't the population density to support sufficient choices in a thinly populated market there. Um, and, and I think they see, they see quite clearly that there is both a kind of pragmatic argument you could make to people about privatization and an ideological argument. And in their case, they see that whatever their ideology, the, that pragmatism demands preservation of their local public schools. Uh, and so it has not been surprising to me at all to see that kind of resistance there where, you know, Americans have long been willing to go against party when they have clear evidence of a contradiction between dogma and evidence. Um, uh, and so uh, I, I think that, you know, it, in many cases, there are opportunities for cross party, cross class, um, interracial kinds of alliances here that, again, would, would just be good for American democracy, even if people then say, well, listen, everything else that you um, value and that you want to vote for, I disagree with. Um, but I'm with you on public education. I think that's an opportunity for all of us um, to, to come together and share something at a time when um, mostly what we do is uh, retreat to our corners. So, Jack, let me build on that spirit with one last question I'm going to pose to you, and then I'm going to come to the Q&A from the audience. But I want to know, like, kind of this moving forward, you know, how do we rally folks together around our uh, public schools as a central institution of democracy, as a, a key part of what it means to be a democratic country? How do, how do we get people to care about that and do something about it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, I think the, the first thing um, is the easiest, and I won't say that it's the most important, but I, I think it's really important, and that is to change the way we talk about it, um, that the way we talk matters. And it doesn't matter for the form of, uh, or, or for the sake of, let's say, political correctness, right, um, that it matters because the, the names that we give to things, the, the definitions that we use, the ways that we choose to identify particular aspects of an institution, an organization, a group of people, et cetera, they focus our attention, right? Um, that, that the language then gives rise to thinking and ideas. And obviously ideas give rise to language as well, but I think that it really matters um, what we what we say 
about our public schools. And I think that that actually has been a lesson for me over the past 10 years. Um, you know, I am a public school parent. My daughter attends an urban public school and I could name 152 ways in which her school has fallen short, in which I am disappointed with how she has been served and in which I want more for her. But I can name a lot more ways than that in which I am proud of the school she goes to. I am honored to live in a community with a school like that. Um, I feel blessed to live in a community where, you know, we see all kinds of kids attending school together. And I can name, you know, 35 ways that that brings me um, a stronger community and, and a better life. And so one of the things that I have tried to do in just my own backyard and talking about my local public school, which is across the street, is to just be honest about it. And I don't mean to you know, talk about the words. I mean, to be honest about all of the ways I depend on that school, right? To be honest about my daughter's actual experience, which is she willingly goes every single day. I do not have to force her to go, right? She gets up and she gets out the door and she is there by 8, 10 every morning and she wants to be, she does not want to be late, right? These are the kinds of true stories that are often pretty mundane and that we take for granted and, and are, are nevertheless kind of miraculous. I watched the other day, the kindergarten students line up. They come to our, we live across the street from the school and we uh, have uh, one of the few yards in our community. They come here and they study our maple tree. And I was watching these students line up and they were just brimming with excitement and could not wait to come do this activity, which, you know, it's like, this is an activity that their teacher cooked up that, uh, you know, that is tied to the community, that excites these kids, that actually, you know, has taught, I think, a lot of kids in the community about like trees and, and what an urban community is. Yeah, I'm going on too long, but I think to talk about our schools and to paint an honest portrait of them, and that doesn't mean to paint a negative portrait because so much of being honest about schools means recognizing the things we overlook. Um, second, try to wrap it up so we have time for questions is is just to remember what we want from our schools um you know that's related to this idea of of how we talk about our schools but to remember that we want so much from our schools um and that's okay but to talk about those things and not narrowly think that schools are only about the accumulation of human capital um or the advancement of career interests um and then you know i i think and those are the easy things. And the last thing is um, that we should align our actions with our values, right? It doesn't just mean casting ballots in particular ways. It means attending public meetings, joining councils, volunteering, right? It means like getting informed, sharing information with people, using public in education as the infrastructure um, for democratic engagement, and then simultaneously viewing it as an end product, right? That depends on that democratic engagement for results. I like that, Jack. I'm definitely going to think more about how I can tell a different story about education and my my own son's experience in, in local schools. I like that a lot. Um, I'm going to turn now to some of the questions that are coming in from the Q&A, and there are some great ones coming in, and I have the hard work of figuring out which ones to pose in our short time. But I want to start with this one, because I think this one gets nicely at the kind of uh, conundrum we're at in Ohio right now. We've had a, a massive recent expansion of our school voucher program, which has um, sent a lot of public money into private schools in Ohio. And what we're struggling with right now is around what sorts of regulation, if any, might be warranted in those kinds of situations. So we're wondering, you know, can you point us to maybe some uh, resources that might compare how different states either are approaching uh, school regulation or maybe something we might learn from the history of private school regulation to make smart choices about how we oversee the private money that's going to, or pardon me, the public money that's going to these private schools. Yeah. Um, so there are, are groups like the Network for Public Education, um, which have actually produced a lot of resources for the public. So I would like, I would go check out what they've got. I would check out some of the resources that the National Education Policy Center um, has on its website. Uh, so that's run out of the University 
of Colorado at Boulder. Um, they've done a lot of work in trying to fact check claims about particular kinds of state policies um, around vouchers. Uh, I think, you know, one of the things that we can pay attention to is if we're looking at um, voucher programs, I think that the first and most important thing to pay attention to is what is the projected size of the voucher program? What is the projected growth? And then to compare that against first and foremost, the size of the private school population as it already exists in a state, because that can tell you a lot about the degree to which the policy is being pursued in good faith, right? If the projected enrollments, or excuse me, if the projected um, uh, take up of vouchers in a new voucher program, particularly a universal one, uh, is smaller, right? If the projections are smaller than the current private school population, you know that this is intentionally misleading because the very first people who use private school vouchers are families who are already enrolled in private schools, right? So we know from work that folks like Josh Callen, people should follow Josh on Twitter. Um, he's a professor at Michigan State University. Um, we know from folks like Josh who have done the legwork that the vast majority of uh, private school vouchers are used by families who did not have their children in public schools to begin with, which ends up just being a cash pull directly out of the public treasury and a way of reimbursing private school families for their tuition costs. Um, so, so paying attention to where the money is going, which families, and the degree to which legislators are being honest about um about the degree to which that's happening, as well as with their projections about um, growth, I think is, is the place to start. And then looking at um, other ways that money may be leaving the treasury, sometimes um, intentionally in a um, poorly managed way. And so the, the case study for this would be Arizona, where they have what's called the education debit card, which comes preloaded with taxpayer dollars. Um, so this is the per pupil expenditure that the state of Arizona would have provided to your local public school if your child were enrolled in the public schools. It instead goes to you and there is intentionally no oversight there. Now, this is not an accident. Um, it is intentional because they wanna make sure advocates of this uh, voucher plan want to make sure that those dollars come out of the public education system because the plan is actually not about empowering families as the rhetoric would suggest it's actually about making sure that the public education system is damaged and if you have a lot of strings that require people to actually spend those dollars at let's say an accredited institution then there's a chance that people won't do it as opposed to if you make it impossible to trace those dollars, then you know they can just go buy a new iPad with it and you will, you will have dealt a very serious blow to the public education system by diverting those dollars. And so looking at the degree to which there is any accountability for spending and accounting of where those dollars go, again, is really telling about the intent of the legislators um, and the backers of voucher bills. Mm -hmm. You know, Jack, too, I, I want to, you know, you talked a lot about money in that situation, but I want to harken back to something you said earlier that was a really important point. And you talked about what makes a public school public. One of the things you highlighted was rights, the rights that children within that school have. And so I'm wondering, as we look at what are reasonable regulations to put on voucher and private school expansion, that rights might be another point we want to pick up, you know, rights to non-discrimination in the school, yeah. rights to ensure um, full services being provided to students with disabilities, et cetera. That may be another space to consider. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a really important point, Sarah, and I'm so glad you made it. Um, unfortunately, right now we have a Supreme Court that is undermining the ability to actually require private schools to honor the rights of, let's say, LGBTQ plus students or students with disabilities. Um, but I think it's nevertheless worth the fight to try to demand that if taxpayer dollars are going towards the education of students in private schools, that those 
schools honor the rights that those young people have in the states that are funding that education. Yeah, yeah. One, one of the questions that's coming in the chat, it was, you know, about the kind of stories we tell in, in schooling and maybe some of the stories we tell to further promote and support public education are about the sorts of rights and guarantees and programming that are provided to our students that are not guaranteed or even commonly provided in some of the private alternatives. So to talk about those services and the kinds of children that are helped by them as a way to further promote that. Yeah. I want to take one more question from the chat and then we'll wrap up for the evening. Um, in, in the hundreds of folks who've logged on tonight, you've got a lot of teachers in the crowd. And one of the former teachers is uh, pitching a question that's right into your wheelhouse, Jack, with some of the work you've done on testing. So um, the teacher is asking, can you speak to the idea of how the constantly changing targets and these benchmarks of standardized testing get used as, you know, data to support the argument that schools are failing. So what's, yeah. what's going on there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that paying attention to testing is really smart because it's revealing of a lot of agendas, a lot of assumptions, a lot of beliefs about the purpose of public education. Um, so what's going on with testing is that you have a few different camps. There is a camp of neoliberals, predominantly in the Democratic Party, though also in the Republican Party, who believe that the, the value added by a public school can be assessed by looking at changes in student standardized test scores. Now, I happen to disagree strongly, strongly with that. I think schools do a heck of a lot more than that. Um, and I worry that an accountability system that's narrowly tailored like that will have all sorts of terrible unintended consequences like narrowing the curriculum, like focusing on the test instead of a sort of rich, engaging curriculum where an educator is responding to the students in the classroom and their unique interests and talents and abilities. Um, but this camp uh, has also then unintentionally in many cases carried water for the camp that has absolutely sought to use test scores as a bludgeon against the public education system. Look how rotten our schools are. Now, you know, the, the look at our schools, their failing argument was often one, was historically one for the past couple of decades used by reformers who would say, but don't worry, we're gonna fix the schools. We've got a new performance management regime that is gonna save the day. Um, and now the, the, the public schools are failing argument has been taken up by those who don't really want public schools to exist at all. And they're all too happy to pick up that rhetorical mantle and use those standardized test scores as evidence. Not that, you know, we live in a country with deep inequality, not that, um, you know, students start and, and end at different places for a wide variety of reasons, but no, as evidence that our schools have failed and that we should instead abandon them and seek a privatized alternative. And the, the one more piece I would add here is that many of those very same people then will strongly oppose the use of test scores or any other kind of outcome measure as an accountability mechanism for private schools receiving vouchers. So they will out of the one side of their mouths say, look at these rotten public schools, their test scores are terrible. And out of the other side of their mouths, they will say, oh no, the only measure of a private school receiving a voucher is whether or not parents continue to choose that school. Parents know best. Well, if parents know best in a privatized setting, whereby their having chosen the school is evidence that that school is successful, right? Then I think we have to accept that that also is an acceptable uh, form of accountability for the public schools. Now, I don't think either of those is right. Um, I think that we as democratic citizens should be able to come together, draw on multiple sources of evidence, deliberate, and then come to a kind of nuanced understanding of what our school's strengths and weaknesses are. I think that's what we should be pushing for in terms of assessment and accountability. And I think testing is right now a, a big problem and something that is, is opening the door towards more privatization. Thank you, Jack. We're coming right up on eight. I wanna turn things over to Susie, who's gonna close us out for the evening. Okay. Uh, I, wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was just uh, totally inspiring. And I hope everybody comes away ready and jazzed to go fight 
for our public schools, which is what my, I'm supposed to encourage you to do. Uh, you know, our public schools are democratic in their governance and in their purposes. They benefit all of us. They're under attack, which is an attack on democracy. Please sound the alarm, name the attack, celebrate and brag about public education wherever and whenever you can. Remind people we must elect public officials who support public education. Speak up about the importance of our system of public education. Feel free to use some of the ideas that are on this list, but you will probably have many more of your own. Write letters to the editor. We need to make sure there's at least one a week in whatever newspaper is near where you live until at least the election and beyond. We have to start talking instead of being quiet about public education. Speak at public meetings. Remind school boards and local officials that public education benefits all of us and they need to focus on its defense. The next one, please. So I'm so grateful to our guest tonight for identifying the wolf at the schoolhouse door and for this wonderful quote that captures why we should fight for our system of public education. No other institution includes so many or strives to do so much in such an egalitarian fashion. I, you couldn't say it better. Education is our collective effort to realize for all young people their full potential, regardless of circumstances. It seeks to move our society forward towards ideals like truth and goodness. I'm really, when I read this, I was just so moved by it. And those who know me know I'm already very, very passionate about this. So please, let's all build a stronger wall of defense for our public system. And I hope tonight's um, uh, event encourages you to do it and to go a step beyond what you would what you would normally do because this is really the time and it needs all of us if we're going to make a difference. Um, final thing is we have one a program um, planned for February 28th, which is really taking the local the Ohio story and looking at the explosion of vouchers and through the lens of the League of Women Voters position on privatizations, the things that must take, be taken into account when, if you ever move public funds into a private uh, providing setting. So I hope you'll join us for that. I think it's even stronger uh, ideas for uh, why we should be fighting so hard and how to focus our efforts. So thank you again, everybody for being here, Sarah, for your great conversation and Jack for your wonderful thoughts. Until we meet again. Good night. Fantastic. <laughs>